for maybe two minutes late on getting started. Um, my name is Cindy McDonald. I'm the Behavioral Health Program Manager at Missouri Primary Care Association, and I'm excited to partner with the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved on our webinar series for suicide prevention. Um, so welcome to our first session of Suicide Safer Care for primary care providers and their teams. Um, I hope to see lots of you on all of the sessions. We have four more after this one. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Rick from the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved to uh, further the introductions. Thank you, Cindy. We're so pleased to be able to collaborate with you on this training. And hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's presentation. My name is Rick Brown, and I'm the Associate Director of Communication and Membership with the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved. I'll be your host for today's webinar, and if you have any technical issues during the webinar, please reach out to my colleague, Joshua Chung, via the chat. For those of you who are new to ACU, we are a transdisciplinary membership organization uniting clinicians, advocates, and organizations in the shared mission to establish a robust and diverse workforce that help transform communities to achieve health equity for all. And we do that through a variety of advocacy, professional education, training and technical assistance, and other initiatives. We invite you to learn more about us and membership of ACU at clinicians.org. Also, if you're interested in more resources on suicide prevention for patients and clinicians, we also encourage you to visit our Suicide Safer Care page, where you can find a variety of resources, including fact sheets, toolkits, archived webinars, and more. And you see that Josh has actually just put that into the chat. Lastly, before we begin, I just wanted to go over a few quick housekeeping items. This webinar will be recorded, and we also encourage you to ask questions as you think of them during the, um, the presentation. Lastly, um, at one point, Verna, as the training begins, or Dr. Little, I should say, will ask you if you can complete a free survey. Um, please be sure to complete this if you haven't yet. Also, Please be sure also to complete our post survey and evaluation of the conclusion of the training. They're tremendously useful to help us continue to improve the quality of our trainings. Lastly, I'm honored to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Berna Little is the co-founder and special advisor for advocacy and research at Concert Health. She is also the chief operations officer and co-founder of Zero Overdose, as well as a member of ACU's advisory council. She's a national expert in suicide prevention, a faculty member for Zero Suicide, and previously served for over two decades as a senior vice president for a large FQHC network in New York. We're excited to have her with us today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Little to kick us off. Hello, thank you. Um, always a wonderful uh, opportunity to some, spend some time with folks in community health centers. Uh, that's one of my favorite things to do for some of you that I may know. Um, so my name is Verna. We're going to spend the next hour or so talking about suicide safer care, very particularly for primary care providers and their teams. So how can I care for someone at risk for suicide during the course of a primary care visit? This is actually part of a larger project where we've trained almost 4,000 primary care providers and their teams in 32 states now. And we've learned a lot. We've learned that primary care providers of all disciplines have said, I didn't get any training, not even in my training program or my current organization. And about 44% of the behavioral health providers in primary care practices said, I don't feel comfortable or competent to care for someone at risk for suicide. And so we really thought about how can we help be helpful for the team to really care, identify and care for people who are at risk for suicide. Go ahead. So a couple of things that we're going to uh, talk about is um, what we're going to do in terms of helping people. And there's one thing that gives um, there's one thing that saves more lives than anything else. And anyone can do it. Anyone can give it. Regardless of your licensure, your background, it doesn't matter. And so, and that is to give someone hope. Um, go ahead. Hopefully, people can have an opportunity to fill out the um, the survey. So, one of the things we know is that it's really helpful to give someone hope. People who have hope don't choose suicide. Suicide is a choice. And so, one of the things that I think people always don't appreciate is how little hope it takes to really give someone enough hope to save lives. They actually are looking for hope. They're looking for reasons not to die. And I think this story of a gentleman who 
uh, was one of the survivors jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge really talks about, you know, if just one person would do something or show me that they care, I won't die today. Um, and so just take a moment and we can listen to this. Um, and then we'll San Francisco, you jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and you're one of the very few survivors. I made my way out to the Golden Gate Bridge, crying like a child, wishing, praying someone would stop me. I walk out on the walkway and then I jumped. In a millisecond, my hands left the rail. Instantaneous regret. This creature circles beneath me, bumping me up. And I'm thinking, you gotta be kidding me. I didn't die jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge and a shark is going to eat me. How many people have actually jumped off? Every time I tell a media outlet the truth about this story, they bury it. This is the emotional story of Kevin Hines. Kevin Hines sadly tried to take his own life by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. Typically, only 1% of individuals who jump survive and if they do, they have life-changing injuries. Kevin Hines remarkably came out unscathed. He now is a suicide prevention advocate as well as a public speaker. I have the pleasure. So this is a little bit of a longer version and I don't want to take the time. We're just practicing our technology, getting videos embedded. So I really apologize. Um, so one of the things that Kevin talks about is how he wakes up in the morning and he is really just consumed with thoughts of suicide and he decides that he's going to die. Um, and he, if just one person shows that they care, then he won't take his life today. He leaves his home, walks down the street, visibly upset, gets on a bus, visibly distraught, says if just one person shows me they care, I won't take my life today walks out to the Golden Gate Bridge, picks a spot and says, if anyone, if one person shows me that they care, I won't die today. Police walked by him, people walked by him. He talks about how his tears literally were, were falling down into the water. A woman comes, taps him on the shoulder and asks, will you take my picture? And so he does, he takes her picture and then she leaves um, and he jumps. And so I think it's and immediately regretted his decision. But I think one of the things that it shows is really people are looking for someone to give them hope for something to be able to to stay alive and reasons for live. And we have the opportunity to do that multiple times during a routine primary care visit. Go ahead. In America. So one of the, no. Okay, so one of the things we know is that lots of people think about suicide. It's not if you're caring for people um, every day who are thinking about suicide, you absolutely are. And so when you think about the number of people that you're caring and you hear some of the data we're going to talk about today, how can we figure out ways to better identify people in primary care um, who are thinking about suicide? Go ahead. You'll see me talk a little bit today about language. You'll hear me say die by suicide. We don't say commit suicide any longer. We die by suicide. We commit crimes. We also want to stay away from language like successful or unsuccessful attempt. I had a 13 year old introduced to me one time and they said, Here's so and so she had an unsuccessful attempt. And so what are we message are we sending? Gosh, you can't even die by suicide successfully or like, had you been successful, you wouldn't be with us. I also hear um, a lot. I get a chance to review charts and see language patient was manipulative or attention seeking. And so one of the things that I've learned in my life is not to pretend to know someone's intent. Like how many times have you found yourself saying like, oh, that wasn't my intent, right? So I don't pretend to know someone's intent. What I do know is that if someone is talking about suicide, they are more likely to die by suicide. So I just start there. And also what's most helpful to my team members is what the patient said or what they did as opposed to that they were manipulative or they were attention seeking and using words like caring for um, as opposed to dealing with is often helpful. Go ahead. And so when we think about how many people we're going to lose to suicide this year, we're going to lose over 50,000 people to suicide this year. And those are just the ones we know about. And when we think about deaths from other um, instances, such as some of uh, the chronic illnesses or some of the other things that we might do some guidance around 
we're going to lose more people to suicide. And actually, unfortunately, we lose healthcare workers to suicide each and every day. We lose a physician a day to suicide, as an example. Um, so we really need to start paying attention um, to people who are potentially at risk for suicide. So when we think about, go ahead. So why are we focusing on primary care settings? So we've learned a lot. One is we know many of the people who die by suicide saw their primary care provider in the month of death. We also know that there's an increase in portal usage the month of death, so much that the VA actually considers it like a risk factor. The other thing that we've learned is that people who are not connected to care, not dental, not mental health, not primary care, they're not connected to care, they actually resurface in care the month of their death, guess where? Primary care. So we have a unique opportunity to identify people who are at risk for suicide. So looking at suicide by firearms, one of the interesting things to note is if you look at the numbers, the younger adolescents, more deaths um, by suicide, firearm related deaths by suicide. And then if you look at older adults, um, a majority of the older adult deaths by firearms are suicides. Go ahead. So maternal suicide, um, it's really interesting to me the number of maternal deaths by suicide. I was actually meeting with a reproductive psychiatrist this morning at Johns Hopkins, and she was talking about how they're really having to rethink how they care for people and the cadence at which they see them because they're losing people to suicide and suicide attempts. When you think about one in five of the maternal deaths are suicide, that's an incredibly high number. Also looking at the, the date, so between 43 days and a year. So if we're not seeing someone until six weeks or we're not seeing them again for a couple of months, we're actually kind of missing the window to which someone might be at risk for suicide. Go ahead. With our first pregnancy, she did have a very serious case of postpartum depression. Um, we were not prepared for it. We didn't think that um, we didn't think that it could happen to us. We, we weren't even very familiar with it. We were very, very much in the dark, both of us. Small signs of changes in her personality that if you didn't live with her, you wouldn't have noticed. Um, um, and since we didn't have a lot of education in the field of postpartum depression, my first instinct was to chalk it up to just being a brand new mom and being nervous and um, it being a new experience for us. recognize the person sitting in front of me. So we dropped my daughter off with her grandmother and got her to the hospital where they said, yeah, this is this is postpartum depression. It's probably one of the worst we you know that, that you could see. It was a good plan. It made sense. We're going to get her on her original medication system. We're going to take any chances. She was going to go right back on it. Um, but we just didn't anticipate how much faster it would return this time. And what happened over the span of weeks the first time happened, it happened over the span of four or five days, and we just were not prepared for it. four great years of uh, her being the best mom she could be. She was a healthy, fully functioning adult, very warm, very happy, very outgoing. Just a very normal, very happy individual, which is what makes this all the more shocking that this happened to her. The change came so 
quickly and so rapidly. And you just, we just weren't prepared. So really thinking about how we're caring for individuals who are at risk and populations and different considerations. So I never thought I would be talking about youth and suicide in the same sentence as much as I am now. When we think about 10.2% of the high school students will attempt suicide. Um, that is an incredibly high number. So think for a moment in a high school classroom, you have about 35 kids. 30 kids, 35 kids, and you think about the number that will attempt suicide there, 10%, and you think about a hallway and how many classrooms are in that hallway and how many hallways are in that school and how many schools are in your community. That's, you start to think about the number of kids that are actually going to attempt suicide. And so those are incredibly high numbers. If you were gonna talk to NIMH, and they would say, if you're working in primary care, you want to routinely screen, screen ages 10 and up for suicide. Go ahead. So one of the things also is geriatric. I know when I worked in primary care as behavioral health, um, leading behavioral health, we didn't get as many referrals for uh, geriatric mental health as the number of patients we had. So even in practices where I had lots of geriatric patients, I actually didn't get as many referrals based on the percentage of patients. And so it's always been interesting to me and sort of we still hear, well, of course they're sad, they're old, right? Or, um, but we actually know that almost 20% of the suicides are geriatric. And interestingly, recently, uh, someone that my mother knew, a senior tried to die by suicide and she said, you know, these are some of the things that he said, and he told the provider, he told the woman coming into his home, he mentioned things to me and like, we didn't, we just thought he was sad, you know? And so really thinking about uh, seniors that are at risk, one of the biggest risk factors for seniors is losing a spouse or partner. So as we think about going forward, we really need to think about putting some systems in place. Drink commissions, HRSA, all of them are actually going to really be paying attention to suicide and suicide safer care, particularly joint commission since there was a 12 year old who died by suicide on a unit. Um, they're really um, working with organizations to think about um, primary care providers and, and suicide safer care pathways. If you have had an opportunity to think about where people fall through the cracks in your system, one of the biggest places is the front desk. So we've had people die by suicide who have called, canceled an appointment. The people at the front desk don't know to do anything different because they don't know that person's at risk for suicide. And so um, we had a woman die by suicide and she canceled three appointments. Nobody knew that she was at risk for suicide and there was no system in place to know that she had canceled multiple appointments. And so that's a place what a lot of organizations and schools are doing is they have handle with care patients and handle with care patients mean that we do something different. And so a, a hole or a place where people fall through the cracks is often the front desk billing other places where we can't do anything different if people don't know someone is at risk for suicide. And so if you haven't had an opportunity to go to the Zero Suicide website, I encourage you to do so. Lots of um, CME, lots of other activities, CEUs, really helps you think about some of the resources that you might need um, to care for people at risk for suicide. So as we go forward, we're gonna talk about, and you'll hear me reference a couple of times, a suicide safer care pathway. It's really important to start thinking about your patients at risk for suicide as a population. And one of the things we know is not everybody needs same, same, right? So a lot of times we used to think, oh, somebody's thinking about suicide or at risk for suicide, we do this. But when you think about it, if we have somebody with asthma or diabetes, not everybody needs the same treatment or the same levels of care. So starting to think about suicide very much the same way and doing it based off of some of the assessment tools that we have that we're gonna talk about so that this can easily happen um, in primary care. 
So, a couple of things to know um, is that there are two evidence based risk assessments. One of them is um, the ASQ and one of them is the Columbia scale. This is the Columbia scale for children and adolescents. I actually don't think it's as well researched um, as the ASQ, although it is out there. Most organizations for children and adolescents will use the ASQ. Um, the ASQ actually has um, information on it to be able to um, ask about um, whether or not somebody is thinking about killing themselves right now. Um, so, I really encourage you, we'll talk about what the ASQ looks like, um, but certainly as we go forward, we'll talk about the two risk assessments that are out there. So, the pathway that I showed is really based off of the color codes in the Columbia scale. So, as we go forward, we'll talk about how to use that during the course of a 15 minute primary care visit. So, one of the things we hear as we've been traveling around, we've heard a couple of things. So, one is, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. And so, um, I came up with something that I used to do when I used to teach family practice and social work students that were caring for people. And they would get a little discombobulated once in a while when they were caring for patients. And we came up with some generic statements that they could just use across the board. And we called them storage statements. So, turns out this actually works really well for people at risk for suicide also. I think all of us can think about a time in our lives when we hadn't told anybody um, something and it was really important and we weren't sure if we should tell anyone. And then we make a decision to tell someone and that first couple of seconds, you know, we have like a, oh crap moment, right? Maybe I shouldn't have said anything, I made a mistake or, I'm really glad I said something. This is going to be really helpful for me. And so the first couple of seconds when someone tells you they're thinking about suicide is really important because it may be the first time that they've ever told anyone. And oftentimes people tell us they're thinking about suicide when we're not expecting it at the dinner table during a patient visit, right on a car ride. Um, and so very important to think about ahead of time what we might say. And so when we think about what do we want someone to know who just told us maybe for the very first time that they're thinking about suicide, I want them to know, I heard you. Thank you for telling me you're thinking about suicide. I want them to know they're important. Your life is very important to me. Your life is important to us here at the center. So um, also, um, I want them to know I have hope for you. Hope actually saves lives, right? I have hope for you. I can see how strong you are. So one of the things that I'd really like for you to do is to just practice. Um, and tonight, maybe when you're driving home, brushing your teeth at the dinner table, staff meeting, lunch meeting, think about two or three sentences that you could say when someone tells you they're thinking about suicide. And one of the things I know is that um, people have said to me over and over again, Verna, I didn't do my homework, but man, I was really glad I remembered your storage statements. Go backward. And so when we think about having those storage statements, that's incredibly important. The other thing that we heard as we were traveling around is we heard from primary care providers and people on the team like, I don't have time, right? Somebody tells me that I'm thinking about suicide, like my day is shot, I absolutely don't have time. And I know working in primary care, man, you're busy, you're going all day long. And so one of the things to really think about is we actually do know how to care for someone at risk for suicide because we actually do it all day long. It's just a matter of taking some of the things that we use for other situations and applying them to suicide. So I often uh, tell a story, a very true story about my husband who was hit by lightning, lost part of his hearing. So we're going to the primary care provider. We get there, lovely medical assistant takes his height and his weight and his blood pressure and leaves the room. I was like, hmm, okay. And so a couple minutes later, primary care provider comes in, takes his blood pressure and says, I'm really worried about you. I'm not sure you're gonna be able to go home. Asked him some questions, got some information, said, listen, I'm gonna go finish up with my other patients. I'm gonna come back. We're gonna figure out what to do and we're gonna talk some more. And she did. 
And we never talked about his hearing loss again that visit because it was no longer front and center. And so whether it had been his blood pressure, which turns out an ambulance ride and a stent later, um, or suicide, right? We would do the same thing. We stop, we get some information, we figure out an appropriate level of care. If you think about what happens with someone with asthma, what are some of the things that would happen if I went into the practice with asthma? I might get a treatment. Um, you would talk to me about my emotional triggers, about physical triggers in my home, carpeting or pets. Um, you might send a referral to a pulmonologist. You might order me a nebulizer. You might give me um, an inhaler and teach me how to use the spacer in the inhaler. We might do an asthma action plan. Um, you might do some other teaching and training. We might fill out an asthma, again, an asthma action plan, right? All of those things would happen. So we have the processes in place. We just need to take someone and it is take some and apply it to patients who are at risk for suicide. And so we're going to talk about what that is going to look like during the course of a primary care visit. So, again, we don't want to panic. We want to use our storage statements and we want to try to move forward and get the information that we need to continue our primary care visit. And so when we think about identifying people, so we've learned a lot about suicide. One thing we learned that is very different from how I was taught is that many people who die by suicide don't have a mental illness at the time of death. What we've learned is the social determinants play a huge role, the housing, the finances, the employment, the relationships. I've had so many providers around the country come up to me and say, gosh, you know, I had patients and I was really worried about them and they died by suicide and suicide never occurred to me yet. They were having medical problems and it really contributed to some of the social determinants, right? Or they were experiencing these social determinants. And a lot of times in federally qualified health centers, providers will say to me, well, all my patients have social determinants. And oftentimes it's a change. So in other words, I had a patient recently and they were depending on a food pantry. Well, unfortunately there was an incident at the food pantry and he wasn't able to go back there. And so that was a change in his ability to really have access to food. He became incredibly at risk and, and felt very hopeless. And so a change in that social determinant. The other thing is we spend a lot of time thinking about depression. Anxiety is a huge risk factor for suicide. Often we don't even think to ask our very anxious patients about suicide. And there's this big misconception that people with major depression are thoughts of suicide and people who are suicidal have major depression. That's actually not um, often the case. We know alcohol and substance use play a role. Also transitions. So people often think of transitions as I'm getting out of the hospital, medical or mental health. However, it's foster care, substance abuse treatment, incarceration, physical rehab. Those are all transitions that really impact somebody's risk for suicide. And we want to ask people directly what we want to know. Many of my patients who are experiencing some of the struggles you are start to think about suicide. I'm wondering if you're thinking about suicide, because one of the things that the research tells us over and over again is that talking about suicide or asking about suicide doesn't give someone the idea. So as we go forward, um, there's a couple of things that you can do right away, starting today. Oftentimes I ask primary care organizations and providers, how many diabetics do you have? And I love to hear, oh, we have a registry and we have this many and we're doing this around the A1Cs. And then I say, well, how many, do you, how many people do you have at risk for suicide? And nobody can answer that question. And so fortunately, we live in a world where there is a code for anything. And so if Rick today walks out of his house and a bat falls on his head, right, there is a code for that. We have codes for everything. So there are codes for suicide risk and suicide attempts. It is so important for you to put those codes on your problem list as the primary diagnosis or a primary diagnosis. That does a couple of things. One, it gives you the ability to know how many people are at risk in your population. The other is it's a huge quality issue because if I'm covering for you, I'm gonna ask different questions or make different decisions 
based on the fact that you may be at risk for suicide. It also gives us the ability to follow up. So I often get a chance to look at charts and I see patients who come in, they're identified at risk for suicide, lots of commotion, things happen, right? And then they come back, see a different provider or sometimes even the same provider, nobody even mentions suicide because it's not an active problem on the problem list and we don't have any way to know. And so it's super important to put it there. And sometimes people actually, usually behavioral health people will say to me, patients don't want suicide on the problem list. And I say pretty unanimously that that's not been my experience to be able to say, you know, I really care about you. Your life is really important to me. And I put that we talked about your thoughts of suicide today in your chart, because I want to make sure that every time I see you, every time my team sees you, every time I talk to you, and every time my team talks to you, we make sure you're safe. So people don't seem to mind. In fact, they actually like the fact that someone is concerned about their safety and it gives them hope. And so really thinking about putting suicide on the problem is you can resolve it, um, but it's there for you and your team. So as we go forward and think about how we're identifying people, many of you are using the PHQ-9. Um, the PHQ-9A here for adolescents, um, there is actually the suicide questions on the bottom, which most organizations are doing now. They're putting the ASQ there. Um, for adults, um, most of the time what triggers questions is yes to question nine. So we know that people who answer yes to question nine are more likely to die by suicide. They're also more likely to die by homicide and other unintentional deaths, but they are more likely to die by suicide. And so we want to make sure that we're paying attention. And so what I will often do is actually just go through the PHQ-9 with people, whether it's on the computer or paper. So I see that you're having difficulty sleeping and that's a problem for you more than half of the days. And I see that you're having some difficulty concentrating like on the TV or to the TV or newspaper. And that's a problem for you more than half of the days. So it definitely seems like you're having difficulty sleeping and sleep is really important. So we absolutely wanna make sure we can um, get you sleeping better. I also see that you have thoughts that you would be better off dead or hurting yourself in some way. And that's a problem for you more than half of the days. So thank you so much for telling me you're thinking about suicide. Your life is really important to me. What I'd like to do is start with your thoughts of suicide and just get some additional information from you. And so you're going to stop. You're going to use your storage statements um, and then you're going to move forward and we're going to get some additional information just like we do for other diagnoses. So this slide is um, the ASQ. You've heard me mention it a couple of times. Um, I like the ASQ again for children and adolescents, particularly because of question five. Are you thinking of killing yourself right now? So to me, that's a crystal clear question. It's a yes or a no, and we can kind of pick a direction. Most pediatric emergency rooms use the ASQ. I also like it because it has a script for parents and for nursing staff, so it's, it's pretty helpful to use. It is one of two evidence-based risk assessments that are there, the ASQ, and on the next slide, you'll see the Columbia scale. Oh, sorry. Um, so one of the things that you heard me mention is an appropriate level of care. We know that everybody who thinks about suicide does not need to go to the emergency room. I worked in an emergency room for 17 years seeing people who were sent there at risk for suicide. I sent most people home. And so we know that sending people to the emergency room who don't need to be there, like any other chronic illness or any other diagnosis, it's not helpful to them. It actually puts them more at risk. And so we want to make sure that the people who need to be there get there and the people who don't, don't. Go ahead. So the way that we really do that is assessment. And assessment can happen during a routine primary care visit. It's the really the ability to understand risk. Go ahead. And so this is the Columbia scale. It is affectionately known as the primary care version. And essentially what it does is it allows us to do things based on risk. So we have our yellow, our orange, and our red patients. 
So one of the things that really distinguishes suicide risk is intent. So we used to do something not great and we used to write patient has suicidal ideation and a plan and we would send them to the emergency room or that would be, but now we know that's not good care, right? We know we shouldn't have done that because what really matters is intent. So great example, I was seeing a, a guy one time um, in uh, New York, Poughkeepsie, New York, which there's no reason to go there if you've never been there, but there is, a walkway over the Hudson, uh, the Hudson River. And he was identified by his primary care provider and I saw him and I asked him and he said, oh yeah, I think about suicide. And then I asked him, you know, had he ever made plans where I'm asking the question, he said, yeah, I would jump off the mid Hudson walkway. And I said, okay, and he proceeded to tell me, well, he said, you know, they put up a fence there now, so you can't jump into the water. I said, yes, and they put a phone there too. We, we did that so that we could keep people safe. And he said, yeah, so he said, I couldn't jump there. And I don't wanna jump in the beginning because I don't wanna land in someone's yard. That wouldn't, I don't wanna do that to someone. And I don't wanna land on route nine, so I'm not gonna jump there. He knew exactly where on the mid Hudson walkway he would jump. And I said to him, do you intend to jump off the mid Hudson walkway today? And he said, Absolutely not. In fact, I'm late for work and I've got some places to go. So absolutely not. Um, so one of the things um, that we know is that it's intent. I can think about suicide. I can know how I would die by suicide, but do I intend to carry out the plan? That is really the key. And so the patients who are red, who answer yes to red, are the patients who have intent. And those are the folks that likely need another set of eyes or maybe another level of care. For our yellow or orange patients, there's actually some great things we can do during the course of a primary care visit that are incredibly helpful for them. And so when we think about going forward, We want to think about um, risk and what we call protective factors. I think of it like a seesaw. So people have thought about how not to die. I ask them, what are reasons you wouldn't die by suicide today? And people have thought about reasons to live. Absolutely. People will tell me, my kids, my family, absolutely. Your children need their mom. Pets, if I bring my pet to the shelter, they'll be euthanized. Your pet really needs you. Religion, job, a lot of healthcare workers tell me my patients, right? So the way I think about it is the more reasons for living someone has and the less intent, the safer they are. The less reasons for living and the more intent, the more at risk they are. So it's a little bit of a balance. So people who have intent and don't have reasons for living are the people that we want to be the most concerned about. Go ahead. And so we want to try to think about safety planning. So for our yellow and orange patients, there's some things that we can do during a primary care visit that are incredibly helpful. So um, we used to do something called contracting for safety. We don't do that anymore. We know it's not, not helpful for people, right? And so we do something called safety planning. So the first thing that we can do, particularly for our yellow patients, is that we can give them the lifeline or 988. 988 is up and running now. I know it's up and running in your state. The interesting thing about 988 is that most of the calls are resolved on that call and don't require any other intervention. It's been shown to be more helpful than mental health treatment. It's evidence-based. It's been shown to reduce suicidal thoughts and behavior. I have people put it right in their phone because we know 911 really good, but 988, maybe not. We might not be able to think clearly. You can have them give it a call, give 98 a call and go see another patient and come back. And now you've given them an evidence-based intervention available to them 24 hours a day right in their phone. Incredibly helpful. I also give them on the next slide, you'll see Now Matters Now. Now Matters Now is an evidence-based website been shown to reduce suicidal thoughts and behaviors, actually give some treatment in terms of some DBT interventions. 
And so I pull it up. I let them look at it. I go see another patient and come back, right? They can pull it up on their phone. So now you've given them two evidence based interventions available to them 24 hours a day. This is incredibly helpful for your yellow and even your orange patients. Go ahead. I sometimes give people the suicide is different website for parents or guardians or other really nice support for them to be able to help in their journey uh, with someone who might be at risk for suicide. We also know that risk can change. So I could be at risk this morning um, and not be at risk this afternoon or vice versa. And so we're starting to see suicide care really resemble fire safety or fire prevention. And so this is the emotional fire safety plan. It's actually on the Now Matters Now website. A lot of primary care practices just hand it to their patients who identify as at risk for suicide. And I always let people know, you know, if we were all in the same room and I asked you, how many of you know what to do if you catch on physical fire? Every one of you would say, stop, drop, and roll, right? Whoever taught us that, like, we all know it. We all know what to do. Even though the likelihood that we're going to catch on physical fire is low, none of us were taught what to do if we catch on emotional fire, even though actually the likelihood that we're going to catch on emotional fire is higher. Turns out some of the same things work. Cold water on our face. Stop, drop, and roll. If I stop, drop, and roll, what am I not doing? I'm not dying by suicide. I'm looking in someone's eyes, either on my phone, in person, a picture that actually has been shown to reduce suicidal thoughts and break those repetitive thoughts of dying by suicide. And so your ability to give this out to people and let them know, hey, now you know what to do if you catch on emotional fire is incredibly helpful. So for your yellow and orange patients, you've given them what to do if they catch on emotional fire and two evidence-based interventions available 24 hours a day. Go ahead. For your orange patients, you may also want to do some additional safety planning. This is actually, um, the Stanley and Brown safety plan, it's the one that's in all of the EMRs. And so there's a couple of things that are really important about thinking about a safety plan. So one is reaching out to people um, who may be helpful for that individual. And so what we like to do is actually call them and talk to them. So, you know, Rick, Verna has identified you as someone on her safety plan. And maybe Rick says, that's great, but I'm a little nervous because I'm not really sure what to do. And then we can give him the um, suicide is different website. Or maybe he says, that's great, except I work in a really busy primary care practice all day. And so I can't pick up my phone or I don't have minutes all month. And so then what we can do is we can say, well, if Rick doesn't pick up the phone, it doesn't mean he doesn't care, right? It just means that maybe we call 988 or we go to the Now Matters Now website. Next slide. Um, the Now Matters Now website. And we can be really creative too. So I ask people, how can we keep you safe today? And people often know, why is Walmart on so many safety plans? Because it's open 24 hours a day, it's available by public transportation, and most communities have one. And so one of the things that's been interesting as we've been traveling around and doing some quality reviews for safety plans, about 85% of the safety plans that we see in organizations don't pass a quality review. So those behavioral health leaders on the line, if you have staff that are doing safety plans, there's some really nice quality measures. One of them is, did we make phone calls to the people that we were listing as being on that individual safety plan? Go ahead. So we also wanna talk about lethal means. So it's important to know someone's lethal means. And we talk about it as it's temporary. This doesn't mean that you won't be able to drive. This doesn't mean you won't be able to go hunting in the fall. For all of my patients who talk to me about dying by suicide and using their gun, I make sure they're safe. It's really important to know somebody's method because oftentimes they don't change a method. If I can keep you safe from your gun, it's not likely that you're gonna die by suicide. Go ahead. And so when we think about lethal means, we wanna try to limit or restrict access. So why do I like Amazon pill pack? 
Um, I like it because it helps me remember my Lucina Pro, which turns out is not that easy. Um, but also it has the individual packs, right? So if I have to open every individual medication, I'm less likely to die by overdose. And so if we can put a, a gun key in a block of ice, the time that it takes me to get that lock is actually, or that key is really gonna reduce the likelihood that I'm gonna die by suicide. And so when we think about lethal means restrictions, oftentimes we think it's the medication that we're giving someone. So I've had so many people, you know, I've asked them, so you've talked to me about wanting to die by suicide and using medication, where would you get the medication? Well, when my grandma died, my aunt saved all of her medication. She has bags of it. Or I live across the street from CVS. And so really making sure that we're asking, where would someone get the gun? There was an adolescent recently that um, someone told me they were working with and they had gone to great lengths um, to limit his access to guns in the home. And when they asked him, that when the clinician actually working with him asked him, he said, you know, it's interesting to me that they took all the guns out of our home, but they moved them to my grandpa's house and I go to my grandpa's house every weekend. And my friend next door, his father has all the guns in the garage. And so he began to rattle off all of the places where he still had access to guns. And so I always ask people, where are the places? Um, I also like to talk to your pharmacy now, like how could we limit medications? Do we have lock boxes? Like what would it look like? People have thought about how to stay alive. One of the things that I find helpful is oftentimes if you ask people, what would we need to do to keep you safe? They get overwhelmed. And so I ask it in the past tense, if we would have kept you from dying by suicide today, what would we have done? And they find it easier to answer that question. I've also learned to change my language around guns. So if we were going to keep your gun safe, so we're not taking your gun away from you. If we were going to keep your gun safe so that it wasn't used to end your life by suicide, what would we need to do? And so really reframing some of the questions. So it's important to have those discussions. Go ahead. So caring contacts are evidence informed. They actually came out of Australia where people were hospitalized. They sent them out into the outback um, and sent them a little note. Hey, you know, just thinking of you, hope you're well, no ask, um, and suicides got reduced. And so primary care organizations oftentimes will send a note. So when you identify somebody at risk for suicide, they have a little note built into the EMR. They print it out, they sign it, and they send it off. It's not attached to an ask. It just says, really glad we had a chance to meet today. I look forward to seeing you next week at our appointment, and the provider might sign it. And so here's some examples on the next slide of caring contacts that you might be able to use. There's lots on the Now Matters Now website. They are actually incredibly helpful. And I think what's really important is to think about them giving someone hope. And so I have a story of my own um, around a caring contact that I think really sort of um, lets people know how important these kinds of things are. When I worked in the emergency room, I would, after I was sending somebody home, I had my little clipboard and I would write a little note. Really glad we had a chance to meet. Hope this note finds you well, Verna. Um, and I would put that in the, the mail basket and, and off it would go. And so I was in the grocery store with my daughter and this woman walked up to me and, and pulled my note out of her purse and said, thank you so much for sending this to me. I carry it with me, it's helpful. And to me, that's just a really good example of how people are looking for hope. And what I wanna say little it takes to give someone hope. And we have the opportunity during a primary care visit by using the right language, using our storage statements, giving somebody some resources that are available to them, doing some safety planning, talking to them about lethal means, 
sending a caring contact. We have so many opportunities. Every one of those activities can give someone hope. And that's during a routine primary care visit. So we have lots of opportunity to give people hope and to ultimately save lives, just putting some systems in and doing some of these things during primary care. Go ahead. There's also a couple of resources that I'll share with you. Um, this is actually a really nice um, video or um, website and service. Um, they actually send caring contacts out to people um, and organizations can contract with them to be able to do that. Um, there's also some good um, websites or apps as well, like the I'm Not Okay app is really good for adolescents. You can program people in and then it notifies them if they're if they're not doing well. Um, there's a couple about the mood diary um, and some others here that are often helpful. The mood tools um, often helpful as well. And so I wanted to make sure that we uh, left a couple of minutes for questions. Um, there's one in the chat that I want to just go back to. I've heard that putting a code in the chart can reduce access to other services that our client needs. Um, and so here's a couple of things. Sometimes someone said to me the other day, well, if I put suicide on the problem list, then they were in a hospital and they felt like um, the patient would be less likely to get into the substance use program that they really needed. And I said, you know, just like any other diagnosis, if that patient had significant diabetes or COPD, you know, they may not want to take them because they may feel that they're too medically complex. We wouldn't take those diagnoses off the problem list. And so we want to make sure that they're going places where people can get the appropriate level of care. And if we're caring for someone, then we need to put all of the diagnoses that we're treating in that active problem list. And we want to make sure that the places that we're sending them are going to be aware and give them appropriate care and treatment and check in and make sure that they're safe. So feel free to put any questions you might have in the chat um, or also um, any um, you feel free to unmute. We're not a huge uh, group. You can feel free to unmute and ask. If you're feeling shy, you can send questions to myself and, and Rick as well. So there's one to me around liability. Um, so interestingly, yes, the emergency room, sending people to the emergency room who don't need to be there, we know is actually more dangerous for people and it doesn't decrease your liability. What is really decreases your liability if you're concerned about it is following the evidence-based practices. We know the Columbia scale and the ASQ are evidence-based tools. Safety planning is a clinical intervention. If you have a suicide safer care pathway, those are actually the best things you can do to both save lives and reduce your liability. And yes, I see some questions in here about um, sending out. We'll share the presentation and some other things. Absolutely. Any questions, comments? I don't know, Cindy, if you have any um, comments or what if they have a diagnosis that's terminal and they choose not to intervene in treatment? So even though that decision may ultimately cause someone um, to end their life sooner, um, it's really important to let people, you know, make decisions about their treatment. Uh, so if people choose to not get treatment, um, then that's a decision that they make with their, their provider. And I see some friends on from Sam Rogers uh, Health Center. It was a pleasure working with all of you. Glad to see you here again. And it really does help us uh, the post survey. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Hopefully we gave you something to think about.
I think, they just, I think they just put in the chat. Um, our next um, session is actually tomorrow. Um, so we hope you can join for that. And then after that, they're spaced out a little bit more. <laughs> and I know earlier um, there were some resources put in uh, the chat, some toolkits targeting pediatric care, targeting I believe, geriatric care, and then another one for um, really focused on primary care uh, providers. They're all really great. I encourage you to check those out um, because they are they do focus on the type of care you're giving in primary care versus a behavioral health organization. So I find them very helpful. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Um, I am really um, always glad to talk to folks in uh, the community health centers and, you know, we're going to have some open open office hours and things to be able to give um, information and guidance. I know that my email is on um, the presentation somewhere. Uh, Rick is available. The folks in your primary care um, also uh, association um, incredibly helpful. So I think we're really excited to support you in your journey to really think about suicide safer care for your patients and your your team members. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.